Are we ready for another chapter of the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? You know, looking back, I think I didn't know what the word wardrobe meant when I was a kid. And so when I told my mom, I was like, that looks really weird. I think it's because I didn't know what wardrobe meant and I was embarrassed. So I'm just putting that out there. You guys know what wardrobe means. Okay. We are on chapter nine. We're over, well, pretty much halfway done. How many pages are there? Yeah. Oh, there, we're on page 89 and there's 189 pages. So yeah okay so what just happened Edmund oh the little snake Edmund like left like that he was missing and they think he went to the White Queen and to tell the White Queen that Aslan's coming and so they were like super nervous oh I told you guys there's gonna be kids that you really like and there's gonna be kids you really don't like and Edmund is just oh I need to show you a meme let me see if I can find it really fast there's like a really funny like, I saw it years ago, and my friend was like, hey, like, do you know the Chronicles of Narnia? And I was like, I'm an adult. Yes, I know what the Chronicles of Narnia is. Uh, Narnia. There's, like, this really funny, now that you guys know what, like, Turkish Delight is, you know? Uh, there's, like, a, so Turkish Delight is only something that you really eat in England. Like, you don't really eat it anywhere else. Uh, and, uh, they so it was this american who had gone to um england and like tried um oh yeah here it is here it is so like this is what it looks like it's just oh i don't know if you can is the screen too bright it's just words but it says just tried turkish delight for the first time it was good but not sell out my family to the white queen good and so that was just like this joke like this guy like went to england tried turkish delight and he's like it was good, but I don't think I would sell out my family to the White Queen for it good. And so, like, it's this huge joke for anyone that knows Narnia. Now, anytime anyone eats Turkish Delight, they're like, but would you sell out your family to the White Queen for it? And so, that's always been the joke with Narnia now. So, and someone said that a couple years ago, like, at a party I was at, and, like, everyone laughed because everyone had read Chronicles of Narnia, so everyone knew what he meant when they're like, it was good, but it wasn't sell out my family to the white like I it was good but not that good and so it's just like kind of always just been this joke now so yeah that's been the joke now with Edmund and Turkish Delight and the Queen here we go chapter 9 in the witch's house and now of course you want to know what has happened to Edmund he had eaten his share of the dinner but he hadn't really enjoyed it because he was thinking all about Turkish Delight and there's nothing that spoils the taste of good ordinary food half as much as the memory of bad magic food. And he had heard the conversations and hadn't enjoyed it either, because he kept on thinking that the others were taking no notice of him and trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't, but he imagined it. And then he listened until Mr. Beaver told them about Aslan and until, and until he had heard the whole agreement of meeting Aslan at the stone table. What a snake. It was then that he began very quietly to edge himself under the curtain which hung over the door, for the mention of Aslan gave him a mysterious and horrible feeling, just as it gave the others a mysterious and lovely feeling. So he heard about Aslan and it like made him really nervous and everyone else heard about Aslan and it like made them excited. Just as Mr. Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone, Edmund had very quietly turned the door handle and just before Mr. Beaver had begun telling them that the White Witch wasn't really human, but half of a giant, Edmund had got outside into the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. You mustn't think that even now Edmund was quite so bad that he actually wanted his brother and sisters to be turned into stone. He did want Turkish delight. Is it good enough to sell out your siblings? And to be a prince, and later a king, and to pay Peter for out for calling him a beast. As for what the witch would do with the others, he didn't want to be any partic he didn't want her to be particularly nice to them, certainly not to put them on the same level as himself, but he managed to believe, or pretend he believed, that she wouldn't do anything very bad to them. So he he liked to pretend that the queen wasn't gonna do anything bad to them. She was just kinda gonna be mean to them, but that was gonna be the end of it. He didn't really think it through. He was just kinda like, she'll be mean to them. Like he he wasn't Edmund's not a thinker, okay? That's the moral of the story. Um, 
Because, he said to himself, all these people who say nasty things about her are her enemies, and probably half of it isn't true. She was jolly nice to me, anyway, much nicer than they are. I expect that she is rightfully queen, really. Anyway, she'll be better than awful Aslan. At least, that was the excuse he made in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse, however, for deep down inside, he really knew that the White Witch was bad and cruel. So deep down, he knows it's wrong, but he's just kind of being a piece of work. The first thing he realized when he got outside and found the snow falling all around him was that he had left his coat behind in the beaver's house. And of course, there was no chance of going back to get it now. The next thing he realized was that the daylight was almost gone, for it had been nearly three o'clock when they sat down to dinner and the winter days were short. He hadn't reckoned on this, but he had to make the best of it. So he turned up his collar and shuffled across the top of the dam, luckily it wasn't so slippery since the snow had fallen, to the far side of the river. It was pretty bad when he reached the far side. It was growing darker every minute, and what with that and the snowflakes swirling all around him, he could hardly see three feet ahead. And then there was no road. He kept slipping into deep drifts of snow and skidding on frozen puzzle, pu puzzles, puddles, and tripping over fallen tree trunks and sliding down steep banks and bark and barking his shins. Is that a thing? It says barking your shins, but I think that's an England thing. I think we'd say like banging your shins against rocks. That's what you get for sneaking out, Edmund. If you had just stayed with the group, this wouldn't have happened. And he was wet and cold and bruised all over. Karma. The silence and the loneliness was dreadful. In fact, I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others if he hadn't happened to say to himself, when I'm king of Narnia, the first thing that I shall do is make some decent roads. And of course, that set him off thinking about being king and all the other things he would do, and this cheered him up a good deal. He had just settled in his mind what sort of palace he would have, and how many cars, and the private movie theater, and where the railways would run, and what laws he would make against beavers, and dams, and was putting the finishing touches to some schemes for keeping Peter out of the, his place. When the weather changed, he is just not very nice, is he? Uh, first, the snow stopped. Then a wind sprang up and it became freezing cold. Finally, the clouds rolled up and away and the moon came out. It was a full moon and, shining on all that snow, it made everything almost as bright as day, only the shadows were rather confusing. He would never have found his way if the moon hadn't come out. Remember like in like the Whispering Town, they were waiting for moonlight to shine? Same thing here, He, the moonlight was kind of what was like leading him. Uh, you remember he had seen a river flowing into the great lower one? He now reached this and turned to follow it, but the little valley down which came up was much steeper and rockier. Uh, even as it was, he got wet through from when he stood under the branches and great loads of snow came sliding off onto his back. Karma. And every time this happened, he thought more and more about how he hated Peter. What does any of this have to do with Peter? What does... Him sneaking off to the White Queen and getting wet, like, none of this has to do with Peter. None of it. Just as all of this had been Peter's fault. But at last he came to a part where it was more level and the valley opened out. And there, on the other side of the river, quite close to him, in the middle of the little plain between two hills, he saw what must be the White Witch's house. And the moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers little towers with long pointed spires on them, sharp and sharp as a needle, and they shone in the moonlight and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. Edmund began to be afraid of the house, as you should be, Edmund. And here's a picture of Edmund going to her castle. Well, her house, but it's a castle. But it was too late to think about turning back now. He crossed the river on the ice and walked up to the house. There was nothing stirring, not the slightest sound anywhere. Even his own feet made no noise on the deep snow. He walked on and on, past corner after corner of the house, and passed and passed till he found the door. He had to go right around to the far side of it till he found it. It was a huge arch, but the great iron gates stood wide open. Edmund crept up the arch and looked inside the courtyard, and there he saw a sight that merely made his heart stop beating. Just inside the gate, with the moonlight shining on it, stood an enormous lion 
crouched as it was ready for the arch. So, like, it was, like, crouched, ready to jump. And Edmund stood, afraid to go on and afraid to go back, with his teeth knocking together. He stood there so long that his teeth should have been chattering with cold. How long this really lasted, I don't know. But it seemed to Edmund for last for hours. So he saw this lion and just, like, froze. Because remember, Aslan's a lion. Then at last, he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still, for it hadn't moved one inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadows as much as he could. He now saw from the way the lion was standing that it couldn't have been lo looking at him. In fact, it was staring at something else, namely a little dwarf who stood with his back to it about four feet away. Aha, thought Edmund. When it springs at the dwarf, then, it will be my chance to escape. So the lion's looking at someone else. But still, the lion never moved. Neither did the dwarf. And now at last, Edmund remembered what the others had said about the white witch turning people into stone. Perhaps this was only a stone lion. And as soon as he had thought that, that he noticed that the lion's back and the top of its head were covered with snow. Of course it was only a statue. No living animal would let itself get covered with snow. Then very slowly, and with his heart beating as it would burst, Edmund ventured to up to the lion. Even now, he hardly dared touch it. But at last he put up his hand very quickly and did. It was cold stone. He had been frightened by a mere statue. Ha, Edmund, ha. The relief which Edmund felt was so great that in spite of the cold, he suddenly got warm all over, right down to his toes. And at the same time, there came into his head what seemed a perfectly lovely idea. Probably, he thought, this is the great lion Aslan that they were all talking about. She's caught him already and turned him into stone. And here's like a, a picture of, there's the lion and all of them. And you can kind of see Edmund hiding in the shadows, like the coward that he is. Can you tell I don't like Edmund? She's caught him already and turned him into stone. So that's the end of all that fine ideas about him. Ha! Who's afraid of Aslan? You are, Edmund. You're afraid of Aslan. And he stood there gloating over the stone lion, and presently he did something very silly and childish. He took a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a mustache on the lion's upper lip and then a pair of spectacles on its eyes. So, like, he drew, like, a mustache on it and then, like, glasses on it. Then he said, Ha! Silly old Aslan, how do you like being stone? You thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on the face of the great stone beast, it still looked so terrible and sad and noble that it, staring up in the moonlight, that Edmund didn't really get any fun out of it. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. So even now, he's still scared of the statue, even as he's like drawing on it. As he got into the middle of it, he saw that there were dozens of statues all about standing here and there as pieces of the chess as if pieces of a chessboard there were stone satyrs and stone wolves and bears and foxes and cat mountains i think that's like a like a mountain lion uh there were lovely stone shapes that looked like women but who were really the who were really trees there were great shapes of a centaur and a winged horse and a longed little creature that edmund took to be a dragon they all looked so strange standing there perfectly lifelike and also perfectly still in the bright cold moonlight that it was eerie working across the courtyard. So like the whole courtyard is covered with like these frozen statues. Right in the middle stood a huge shape like a man, but, a, but as tall as a tree with a fierce face and a shaggy beard and a great club in its right hand. Even though he knew that it was only a stone giant and not a live one, Edmund did not like going past it. He now saw that there was dim light showing from a doorway on the far side of the courtyard. He went to it, and there a flight of stone steps going up to an open doorway. Edmund went up then. Across the threshold lay a gray wolf. And here's the gray wolf laying on the, the steps. It's all right. It'll, it's all right, he said to himself. It's only a stone wolf. It can't hurt me. And he raised his leg to step over it. Instantly, the huge creature rose, and with all the hair bristling along its back, opened a great red mouth and said in a growling voice, Who's there? Who's there? Stand still, stranger, and tell me who you are. If you please, sir, said Edmund, trembling so he could hardly speak. 
my name is Edmund, and I'm a son of Adam that Her Majesty met in the wood the other day, and I've come to bring her the news that my brother and sisters are now in Narnia. You idiot! Quite close, in the beaver's house. She, she wanted to see them. I will tell Her Majesty, said the wolf. Meanwhile, stand still here if you value your life. Then it vanished into the house. Edmund stood and waited, his fingers aching with cold and his heart pounding in his chest. And presently the gray wolf, Ma Ma Magrium, I think that's his name, Magrium, the chief of the witch's secret police. So this wolf is in charge of the secret police. Came bounding back and said, come in, come in, fortunate favorite of the queen or else. Not so fortunate. So he's saying, yeah, come in, the, you're a favorite of the queen. I hope that's a good thing. He's like, yeah, fortunate favorite, or maybe not so fortunate. So even he's saying, this queen's dangerous. And Edmund went in, taking great care not to tread on the wolf's paws. He found himself in a long, gloomy hall with many pillars, full, as the courtyard had been, of statues. The one nearest to the door was a little fawn with a very sad expression on its face, and Edmund couldn't help wondering if this might be Lucy's friend. The only light came from a single lamp, and close beside this sat the white witch. "'I've come, your majesty,' said Edmund, rushing eagerly forward. "'How dare you come alone?' said the witch in a terrible voice. "'Did I not tell you to bring the others with you?' "'Please, your majesty,' said Edmund. "'I've done the best I can. I've brought them quite close. They're in the little house on top of the dam just up the river, with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver.' "'Idiot.' A slow, cruel smile came over the witch's face as she was like, uh -huh. Is that all your news? she asked. Don't do it, Edmund. No, your majesty, said Edmund, and proceeded to tell her all that he had heard before leaving the beaver's house. What a snitch! What? Aslan! cried the queen. Aslan! Is it true? If I find you have lied to me, please... I'm only repeating what they said, stammered Edmund. But the queen, who was no longer standing to him, clapped her hands. Instantly, the same dwarf whom Edmund had seen with her before appeared. Make ready our sled, ordered the witch, and use the harness without bells. And that's the end of that chapter. Why wouldn't she want bells? What are your guys' thoughts? I'll add a flip grid. But that's one of the things is, why don't you think she wants bells on her sled? I'm telling you, Edmund, he's a little snake. Mm-hmm.